Hello, this is Blind Boy from the Blind Boy podcast and this is a staycast from Acast. While you're all at home quarantining due to coronavirus, don't forget to visit the HSE website for current updates and, you know, fill your time by listening to podcasts. And I'd like to recommend to ye to listen to the Irish History podcast, which is a legendary Irish podcast that has been around for almost a decade where you can learn everything and anything about Irish history. Give it a crack, the Irish History Podcast. Mind yourselves and God bless. Hey, welcome to the Horse Hour Podcast. I'm Amy Frost. My guest today is James Hick. He's the new chief executive of the British Horse Society. And in these unprecedented times, not only do we talk about how he's coping with the coronavirus and the advice that the BHS are giving our industry, but we also go back. And before we were on lockdown, we were at the National Equine Forum. James had a session on access bridle way access and how we can keep our horses safe when we're riding and hacking so james is here today to answer those questions for you this is horse hour hey welcome to horse hour i hope you're well and staying safe right now it's really tricky for us especially uh, as we need to go out and tend to our horses and and actually it's quite good for us to get a little bit of headspace where we can so if you are managing to go and see your horse then uh, i hope you're managing to do that safely and if you're stuck at home right now then i hope that you're okay and using social media and the internet and facebook and facetime to be able to stay connected with people um i know that that we've been relatively quiet over the last month just trying to get my head around everything really I had some great episodes to be able to launch and to be able to publish and share with you um, but but the truth is it didn't feel right uh, some of the stories were highly personal and um, so we just wanted to kind of muddle our way through this pandemic and uh, at some point I will release those episodes for you so you can hear other people's stories um, but for now really it's about um, staying safe and uh, just getting through this quite tricky time. So what I'm doing is trying to use this time for education and for learning a little bit more about how I'm going to handle my horse, things that I can do when when we can get back into riding and, and you know, when we've got a little bit more normality. Um, but for today, I thought it'd be great if we spoke to James Hick. He's just started at the British Horse Society and uh, I've been really looking forward to speaking to him because he's been working hard to help keep the, the access and the bridleways open for us. So James, welcome. Welcome to the Horse Hour podcast. How are you? Very well, thanks. Thank you. It's really funny, actually, because I haven't looked in the mirror for most yeah. of the day and um, there's no time with horses and things. And I just realised I've got my top on that I get from the BHS when I joined. Goodness knows how many. Oh, really? Yeah, you get a free little oh. jumper. And I thought, oh, that's that's funny, nice. isn't it? I've got that on today. Nice. I still wear it. I got my I got a welly bag. I might have had an option to have it, uh, but I got a welly bag that lives in, the, in my boot. It's always been there for the last 10 years with my old wellies yeah. in. Just in case welly bag, you know, when you get out of the car and you're, you're desperate for a pair of We always need one. We always think that these um, promotional goodies, you know, never get used, but actually they're quite great to have because they stick around. Oh, exactly. So they? how yeah, are you yeah, finding yeah. the role then? I joined in uh, 2nd of December. Oh, okay. Actually, it was my first day of work. And I spent most of December working in HQ up at Stonely there. And then I spent all of January and all of February out on the road. And I think I managed about, and most of first part of March I think I had about 120 meetings with different people oh up and down the country uh, I went everywhere bar I didn't make it I got, had got cancelled going to Ireland and I got cancelled going to um, Wales but beyond oh, that yeah. I've been the length and breadth of the country and met lots and lots and lots of our um, in different uh, communities and stakeholders so I had a fantastic insight in those first few months of what we do and who we're doing it for mm. and now um you know we've been into this for the last five weeks or so however many weeks it is which again has been um you know it's, it's obviously you know a terrible situation that we're all in at the moment but from a activity in terms of what we as a bhs have been doing you know we've been just working flat out in truth trying to support all the different types of stakeholders um that we've got and the wider equestrian community 
And, you know, everybody's got so used to the technology now and how we communicate and how we work and all of that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we sort of got used to it and got on with it and, you know, you would never choose it, but it's, you know, I think we've been pretty successful in terms of keeping our charitable aims going at the same time as trying to defend our cost base like everybody else and revenue, but, but really being there for our members, you know, being by their side. You know, I could say I'm a little bit biased uh, because I'm a bit of a BHS fan. Um, I know, I know but let's you are. Pretend... I've been checking you out on, uh, <laughs> on your Twitter feed and various other things. So thanks for all your support. You're very welcome. Okay. But let's pretend for a moment that I'm that I'm unbiased. Um, and, and actually, I find that uh, with the whole coronavirus, it's very scary uh, as a business owner, as a horse owner, as a just a general person um, with with knowing what was going to happen and preparing and just trying to feel mm. safe, really. And what I felt you did really well was you informed us immediately of of your interpretation of what the government was saying. And you, you kind of became that safety net because no Nobody knew where to go. Now, really, without talking too badly about the other equestrian, mm, mm. Uh, you know, parent, I, I call them the parents, the governing bodies. I didn't hear from a lot of them for a really long time, whilst oh. it was you and the BEF that came out first and said, look, this is what we think you should do. We think you should be safe. And actually, you got a lot of a lot of grief for that, which I thought was a bit unfair. Yeah, I I think it's like all of these things. It depends when you drop into social media, doesn't it? Mm. At what point in the emotional roller coaster people are on? I mean, you know, all of us. You know, I mean, you're you're as big a fan as the horse community as one can find, and uh, everybody's desperate to keep on their horse and either on a yard or a riding school or riding school proprietors or you know, the stakeholder group. So, huge amount of emotion there with people having to leave what they were their passion mm. um so uh and i think as people sort of work through that in the first week uh, we try to work through it and interpret all of the uh the first week seven eight ten days i suppose it was really as people started to settle down a little bit then i think people started to get their own uh, sort of rhythms uh, but it, yeah it's been it has been difficult and, and it's, it's been it's difficult for everybody on every level isn't it whether you're a professional or non-professional or, or just a sort of you know a leisure rider like me so um yeah we've tried to we've tried to and, and you know hopefully you've seen some of the big ticket items that the team worked on and developed over the last 10 days or so like the riding school hardship fund that we've um, produced you know, there's about three hundred thousand pounds in that fund now. Wow! Our donations appeal just went over fifteen thousand pounds today, which is the highest donations appeal we've achieved so far. I think in you know certainly in the team's recent memory. Um, so it just shows how people really care, um, mm. and rightly so. Uh, those riding schools, particularly, got their revenue cut off on uh, on the first day of lockdown, and we all know they've got high costs of running and welfare. Mm. And, uh, they need support and you know we're like I say right here by their side through through this thick and thin well thank you for everything that you're doing and and to support you know supporting the industry because um I think a lot of us do feel alone right now and it's good to know that there is help out there and um we're all, we're all just trying to you know find our way through right now and it's great that your team are on the phone if we need any help or we're unsure about something and you know it's not just all about money it's also about um our mental health and our security and and just checking in that we're okay so so mm. thank you for that um I could talk to you James about this for ages I've got so many questions for you but I am under strict instructions today that we have to talk about the National Equine Forum because we want to talk about the National yeah, Equine absolutely, Forum absolutely. Um, because uh, you know as, as, as awful as all this is at some point we're hoping that the coronavirus will disappear um, and we would like to continue with the good work that you guys have been doing up until now and one of the things that you talked about at the NEF was access and bridleways and if anything I think there's a bit of, been a bit of a rise in um, conversation about bridleway access because more people have had time to ride right now more people have had time to go for walks and they're saying hey you know actually I've got time to think about this problem problem that I've got so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what you talked about at the National Equine Forum please. Yeah absolutely and um, you know you're spot on in terms of what's happened throughout this the coronavirus period because 
although it's obviously a terrible time for everybody, um, specifically when we when we think about access, one of our four charitable aims, we've uh, as as a team we've had to furlough a few of our team members in access, but we've got uh, four um, of our access officers are out working in in the, across the UK, as well as our project management group. And of course, our fantastic volunteers have continued to work th throughout the um, period as well. And we've got around about 270 volunteers who are specifically focused on access. But our 2026 campaign that is really critical is all about how do we make sure that as many routes as possible are on the definitive map. And it's really, really important that we make sure that we are recording all of these uh, routes. Otherwise, they're going to be lost forever. And we need safe riding routes for the generations to come. We absolutely do. But that's a huge task for you to have. I know that there's um, some great access. Uh, what do we call them? Uh, what would you call your access people in each area? Yeah, so uh, access officers. Um, yeah. And uh, there, there's all sorts of ac acronyms, but we've got uh, volunteers and, and officers that are up, and, up and down the country. And it's great because if you see somewhere when you're riding or when you're walking that you think should have been or used to be a bridal uh, a bridal way and now it's closed off, then we just have to get in touch with our local officer. Um, and, and normally they've got a Facebook page or they can, you can go onto your website, can't we? And we can look at the access routes and how to, um, you know, mention it to them. And then they fight the corner for us. Is that right? Absolutely right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's opportunity here for both a question and non a question people and just people who love to be outdoors and everybody can get involved. And we really would encourage everybody to be involved, not just the questions and people who, who are riders on bridal ways, because it's really important that um, we use our partners as well um, across cycling and rambling to make sure these routes are open. So mm. if anybody does want to come and join uh, and support us in this, they can go onto our website, search for 2026, and then there's a really handy toolkit on there and they can get involved themselves. Or as you say, they can send us an email, get in touch, give us a ring, and then we can try and get somebody on the case. And how long have you been doing this for? Uh, we, I mean, it's always been a charitable aim of the BHS for sort of many years. Um, but really and truly, the campaign, the 2026 campaign has been running for a, a couple of years now. And although it feels like 2026 is like a long, long way away, many of these applications that we make uh, take time and it does take some hard work um, to get them recorded. And because there are thousands of them that need to be recorded, then we need more time. And we're keen to make sure that we're trying to lobby government to extend the deadline, because in truth, why should there be any deadline to make uh, routes available that are already there for the public to use? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I, I do have a question. I've got lots of questions for you, James, actually, because you were kind enough to answer some of the questions at the National Equine Forum. We've got a few extras, if that's OK. Right. But, yeah. but one big question that I hear a lot, um, and I've wondered myself, is the difference between a bridal way that's owned by uh, the council and a bridal way that's maybe owned by a farmer. So it's very difficult to know what is a, a, you know, a public right of way and what has been a permissive route. And I found myself getting very frustrated thinking that there's a bridal way and seeing, you know, a few years later, it's closed off with fencing and barbed wire and thinking, how can they be so mean to not let me through there? <laughs> um, but not really knowing who to contact. So how can we find out the difference between the two? And should farmers be allowing us to, to, to go along these bridal ways? Yeah, there's two fantastic questions there because th the first one is how do we really know uh, what type of route it is? And of course, there's an opportunity to go and look at OS maps and really see what is already recorded on the OS map and um, you, you, you know, using the key there. And of course, do give us a ring as well here at um, BHS HQ of information found on our website and we'll again be able to look at that with you and just um, walk through it and just uh, help you to sort of determine if there are some technical um, issues that you need to work through. And the second part of that question uh, about landowners and, and farmers, you know, w we need to work together uh, on these things and it's most certainly not to, um, us against them. This is about collaborating and often farms and landowners 
think that they can close routes and doing it for good reason. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, what we've really got to just have a good discussion about is how do we uh, make sure that access routes that should be open to the public um, are open to the public. It's interesting because there are, um, I I look at things from both perspectives, both as a land um, owner and as a rider myself. And a lot of the time, we're not respectful enough to be, I'm not surprised that the farmers say, hey, you know, I don't want you coming down here because they put these rules in place and a lot of us break them, uh, which makes those relationships even, even harder, really. So I guess it's a case of, you know, fixing those relationships, but also looking after them and being really as respectful as we can be so that we have these these places to ride. In terms of the council, then, if I was to go to a bridal way and, and see that it was all completely overgrown, I'd like to think that um, <laughs> I'd like to think that. I'd make the effort myself to go and cut those trees down and make it better. Um, But I I can't say I would do that all the time because, you know, life gets in the way. Who could I ask to help with that if there was an issue with the bridal way? Yeah, I mean, firstly, it's the landowner's responsibility to make sure uh, bridal ways and uh, access routes are are kept clear. And and then the local authority have the responsibility of making sure that the actual uh, route is is of the of the right of standard to be able to use it. So there is a sort of uh, combination of responsibility there, but of course we also want to be able to help. And in many many cases, the, the BHS has worked with landowners and local authorities to contribute uh, both financially and with our great volunteers and our own operation staff to help to clear some of these routes and resurface routes. So it's it's often a team effort. And as I said before, we also want to collaborate with cyclists and the Ramblers Association. So, again, if you see opportunities like that, get in touch and then we can uh, see if we can get a a team on the case. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to some questions now from um, people who watched you at the National Equine Forum. We didn't quite have time to answer them all. So if we start with uh, Steffi de Bootman, we are already seeing paths being closed with the new trespass legislation. Will that mean more problems? Yeah, the government consultation was really in respect to unauthorised encampments. And uh, the British Horse Society has written to the Home Secretary expressing our concern and making sure that there aren't any unintended consequences from that legislation. So um, we've certainly got our eye on that one. A great question there from uh, Steffi. Yeah, good, very important. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Doug Smith. What are the BHS doing to ensure that riders understand they have responsibilities as well as rights when using public highways and bridleways? Which is interesting because we kind of touched on that a moment ago about, you know, are we responsible and how responsible are we? Yeah, again, this is it's definitely a two-way street for all of us, isn't it? Uh, in the fact that uh, we, we have a great responsibility as the equestrian community to show that respect, stay on the pathways, do the right thing. And for us, we're uh, it's, it's, a, it's very much part of our message and what we encourage people to do. And of course, there are uh, other actions that we take in terms of trying to help the uh, equestrian community. And one of our um, programmes that we have, which is the BHS Ride Safe Award, this is really about helping uh, equestrians to not only ride safely on the road, but how to use bridleways, how to pass people, how to ride past cyclists. So it's, it's really a, a great um, way to sort of develop your own, um, your, your own knowledge, but it's also a fun thing to be able to do and to be really safe out there on the roads. This is Acast Recommends. Every week, we pick one of our favourite shows and this is one we think you're going to love. Hi, I'm Louis Theroux, documentary presenter, journalist, locked down human. And I want to tell you about my new podcast, Grounded with Louis Theroux, from BBC Radio 4. Like you, I'm in lockdown, and so are many of those I've always wanted to talk to. So I've tracked down some famous, mysterious and controversial guests. I want to dig deep and find out how they became who they are today. We might be far apart but maybe we're more connected than we think. Acast is home to the biggest podcasts from Ireland and around the world. Subscribe to this show and hundreds more now via Acast or wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's brilliant. It's a bit like your cycling proficiency, isn't it, really? Where you help us, we know the signs and which way to go and um, how to ask people to slow down and, and how to say thank you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> how to wear your high vis. You know, it's, exactly it's brilliant. Right. We can get these books, can't we? You're under your education centre on your website. You've got a shop. With, um, that's it, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's, funnily enough, during the lockdown, we've never sold more books and more equestrian uh, uh, information, as you can imagine. So our education uh, team have been really busy. Uh, plenty of books and education there for everybody to go to. Yeah, thanks. For I was thinking of this the other day, and I was thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be great if you were to do Zoom sessions? Uh, one of my friends who's an instructor has set up some Zoom Zoom sessions for people to do the theory side. So if there was a way we could pass the theory online, then when we're out of lockdown, we could literally just pop to the local BHS centre and do the uh, practical side. By the time we're out of lockdown, you could have a load of equestrians that are halfway there. Well, do you know what? You're spot on because we've had hundreds of coaches actually uh, have, uh, as you say, Amy, migrated to doing theory parts of both our challenge awards and of our stage professional qualifications online and this has been really helpful and we've trained about 150 or so coaches how to deliver that online as well we've also reduced the costs of our uh, challenge awards as well for people until the end of june Uh, the books and all the other associated information so uh, yeah no absolutely using using technology has really helped uh, with the theory amazing then we can get back on it as soon as we can get back on board yeah of course oh that's good and we can find out more information about your challenge awards again on on your website is it bhs.org.uk that's it spot on yeah yeah Okay, so another question then from Javon. Quiet country lanes are changing into busy roads due to house building. Could vulnerable road user awareness be part of housing plans, especially in rural areas? I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, it is. And and uh, often uh, housing developments, of course, think about cyclists and, and pedestrians, but very much part of our and the society's access team is is really aimed at monitoring um, planning um, applications that are going in for housing developments and mm-hmm. trying to get in and part of the consultation process to make sure that uh, the equine uh, routes are there so that what might happen is sometimes bridleways get cut off because housing estates get built and then it becomes a difficult, busy uh, and not safe uh, route to, to go through. So we've got some great examples of where we've intervened but we do need more people to, sh- to shout out and help us and join the cause in bringing this to people's uh, knowledge. I think I find people uh, find us a bit of a pain and we really don't want to be in the way. We don't want to ruin people's planning permission or anything like that. We just want to be safe. And I find that I'm hearing a lot of people saying that on the roads as well, when they're on the roads, they don't really want to be on a road. We'd love to be on a, an amazing gallop track as a bridal way, um, but they're just not there. Yeah, you're right. I mean, only 20% of equestrians, or I think it's less than 20%, sorry, actually have direct access to a bridleway. And, and therefore, more than 80% of people are having to go on the road. And we, we just want safe, safe routes, as you say. Absolutely. Um, and that's the key. Okay, another question. Are you seeking to impose new routes on landowners? That's from Stian Johansson. Yeah, it's a really important question and we don't want any confusion. What, what the BHS is not trying to do is create new routes for landowners. That That's not our, uh, our objective. The 2026 project really aims to make sure that we record the historical routes that are already by law uh, open to uh, questions and other people to use. And we need to get these on the definitive map. And that really is uh, critically important. Otherwise, they'll be lost forever mm. and uh, you know we know there's been in the last 10 years there's been around about four and a half thousand incidents reported to us and a yeah, thousand horses have been injured and you know nearly 400 horses have been killed um, on the roads and 44 humans terribly have lost their lives so trying to make sure these routes are available that are you know rightfully available to the public at the uh, are now and really need to be put onto the map uh, in terms you just made me think of another question actually in terms of footpaths then james some things are registered as footpaths some are registered as bridleways they're two obviously very different things however some footpaths would be really suitable bridleways and you can't find a bridleway for a really long distance 
is there an uh, is there a chance of us being able to get that footpath changed into a bridal way? Well, there's no reason that we can't go to the local authority to to make the case. And uh, I, I'm like you, I often out hacking. I, I see a footpath and it does look uh, does look as though it could be sometimes better than a bridal way in many cases. Uh, but yeah, no, we can certainly take the cause to the local authority. And if people see those sorts of opportunities, again, come through to our team on the website or uh, through uh, through directly giving us a call. And, um, you know, let's see if we can put a plan together. Oh, amazing. Hey, James, what horse do you have? Uh, I've, I have got three Shire horses. Oh, amazing. Uh, they're my, yeah, they're my, uh, my thing, particularly. And uh, how old are they? Uh, we've got a range of ages. So we're down for the, um, my mare is, I think she will be turning eight this time. And her gelding is, um, what's he now, five this time grown up before you know it and the other one is uh just uh two oh, so we've lovely. got two five and eight yeah goodness and do you do any driving with them as well or is it just hacking i would love to do driving i just just haven't got the time and mm-hmm. and you know you need a helper and you know i, I had a Percheron previously and uh, she was a, a driven and ridden um Percheron and uh, we had a great time with her but she was really already properly uh, backed and um uh, ready ready to roll so i had fun with her so you may you? you may oh i have a i have a frisian cross gelderlander oh, nice. um which sounds very you know unique like i went yeah. out to find a frisian cross gelderlander i really didn't like <laughs> um he's he's the most fabulous horse and has such a lovely soul he's really yeah. kind but uh, you you may have heard of the Percherons in the New Forest then the Sampson family. Mm. Um, I yeah, I I know Robert Sampson, yeah. Yeah, I do, yeah. He's, renowned uh, family he's... for having the most beautiful Percherons and they often do displays and things, but they still use the horses as working horses on the farm to, today, which is lovely. Absolutely. Yeah, no Robert Sampson, he's well famous um in our personal world and uh yeah they, he's a he's a great campaigner and got you know you you may have seen him when he's sort of hitched up 15 16 um Percherons all at once when he's plowing and harrowing and doing all sorts of amazing stuff it's and amazing. out hunting goes out hunting you know all sorts of these boys of farriers as well you know it's great I used to, I was lucky for a period of time, I lived um, in a house that was backing onto his land really? and there were 20 acres and it was all open. And one morning, it was a misty morning, it was like something out of a stunt movie. Yeah. I just see this guy galloping across, you know, like a cowboy with yeah. this huge pressure on. I was thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't even know these horses could run that fast. Um, but no, they're, they're incredible horsemen. Have you ever seen his Viking helmet? <laughs> No, so I he, he, when he goes driving to driving competitions, he's got two Percherons in, in hand and then he's got his helmet with his um, horns on <laughs> that are like Viking horns. And he looks just fantastic. Yeah, really. Amazing. There's another uh, heavy horseman near me as well in, um, in the New Forest called Nigel. And he has, oh, no, I forgot what they're called. And they are on the rare breeds list too. Um, Suffolk's or yes, Suffolk or Suffolk punches. Yeah. And so yeah. what he does is every year he brings, um, he actually carts, carriages, uh, Father Christmas into town, which is oh, really lovely, right. and yeah, the Christmas yeah. tree. And yeah, it's brilliant. beautiful. It's beautiful to watch those. Yeah, nice. Back to yeah. the NEF, a couple anyway, more questions yeah, for you because they really are good ones. Um, can you please, this is from Jennifer, can you please define off-road hacking? Does hacking along a quiet country road or lane for five minutes to get to a bridle path still count as off-road riding? No, I, th- I think it's really, if you have to go on a road, if it's designated for, for vehicles, then uh, then we're we're on the road as such. So it, it is what it says on the tin, I think, in most cases. And that's really the um, the case. And, and of course, what, what we want to make sure is that those tracks are, are open and uh, not obscured by anything for us to be able to ride down. Wonderful. Thank you. And then from Siobhan, can we also ask the public to help us with welfare by driving appropriately and not littering? Hacking simulates roaming and is good for physical and mental health. Yeah, uh, and it's a great question as well. As, as we know, there's two parts of that question. I think for me, there's the work that we do across our safety team, another one of our major four charitable aims, mm. really making sure that we are sending the message very clearly through our dead slow campaign. And this is trying to educate and share with drivers and also the riding community to say, you know, when you're going past a horse, go wide and slow, slow down to 15 miles an hour or lower. 
and try and be careful and considerate for the for the horse rider. I mentioned the stats before of how many horses have, have been killed and people have been killed in the last 10 years. And that's about 400 horses nearly and, and uh, 44 people, which has been terrible. So we're very, very much um, trying to support the education of drivers and also um, of the rider. Mm. But we also say to the second part of the question here that um, has been asked is, we're very much aware of, and all of us that ride and, and the wider um, community understand that the health benefits out of being out in the open, doing exercise, whether it be on the horse or off the horse, mucking out, looking after the horse, looking after the land so that we keep our horses on, is is great for our, both our body, soul and mind. And we also uh, more broadly have a program called Changing Lives Through Horses, and this is, again, where we're working with young um, and often deprived children to help them have a second chance in being able to work with horses, to bring them back into some uh, way of working and get some structure in their lives. And it's been a tremendous success. I think it's lovely. Any opportunity where we can give someone the chance to spend some time with horses, um, I think they keep us sane uh, as, as much as it's hard. <laughs> it's tough at times, especially in the winter. Um, we just know that, that there are therapy, really, as much as um, we're probably other people's therapy at the same time. It's, a, it's great to have a community where people can actually reach out to each other and, and support each other, um, which has been particularly difficult, I think, during coronavirus because some people have been able to go riding and others haven't and haven't wanted to for various reasons. And there hasn't been a ban on riding. So many people are saying, you know, they want to ride because it's good for their mental health. And other people are saying, well, they don't because they don't want to put the NHS at risk. And and it's one of those really difficult times where I feel like we're really stuck in the middle to know what's the right thing to do. Yeah, no, you've, you've summarised it really well. And I think at the end of the day, we've got to risk assess our horses and what we do and do things very carefully and, um, you know, do do the right thing. Absolutely. I kind of wish the government had just given us a say you've got to do this or you don't ha- you you know you mustn't you mustn't do this or you can do that but while we're given an option and it's our choice oh it's so difficult but um but are you are you managing to carry on riding are you spending time with your horses or are you too busy on zoom yeah no absolutely it's been uh, like all of us we all need to uh, release our uh, tensions and uh, I've been uh, really with my horses on the ground in truth um but you know everybody has to make their own choices but um, I, I've uh, taken a lot of solence and taken a lot of wise advice as you do with the conversations you have with the oars um, and uh, <laughs> that unique bond that we all know that we get from horses and we obviously want to encourage other people. I think most importantly when this is all over and we start to get the lockdown starts being lifted I'd really uh, try and encourage people perhaps who have not thought of riding or have been away from riding for some time to get back to your local riding school, give them some support because these are the lifeblood of the equestrian community and we really want riding schools to be able to get back up on their feet as quickly as possible and start getting people back um, back riding and perhaps you know get more people riding than were before because it's such a fabulous thing to have that bond, as you and I know, between your horse and your rider. It's, it's really is a privilege to have. James, thank you so much. It's been really lovely to meet you. Um, and I wish you the very best success as your new, well, kind of new role with the British Horse Society. Um, good luck lobbying government. I hope you fight for us as hard as you can. <laughs> we are. Well, we're, we're doing that now. I mean, we're across a whole number of different areas at the moment through the uh, lockdown. We've been talking to DEFRA uh, directly, and I talk to them every week, in fact, on, a, um, on an equine and wider animal uh, welfare call. We're also lobbying into the Treasury, into local authorities on different aspects around uh, business rates and uh, relief and uh, welfare a- a- activity and about how do we um, you know, forward the other aims that we've got. That, you know, none of these have stopped or gone away through lockdown. It's just we've had to put emphasis on perhaps some of the other things. Mm. Well, if you need any help from our community, then um, or you'd like us to do any surveys, then we'd love to help you because, you know, what better to ask than the people who are in those roles themselves, particularly through the hard time that they've been having, because 
there's many that haven't been you know I for one wasn't able to get anything nothing um because I couldn't have rural relate rate relief um I, there was just a whole bunch of things and sadly I didn't meet any of the criteria and the people that I'm speaking to are kind of in this gap as well so um happy to put some surveys out if you'd like to hear from our listeners and what they think and I promise they'll be nice you know we're not yeah, mean you've, you've got great <laughs> listeners we love all your listeners we want them to be our members as well carry on or many of them keep supporting us they've been brilliant through this um through this difficult time but thank you for the offer James Hick, Chief Executive of British Horse Society. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. If we want any more information, then we can head to your website, which is bhs.org.uk. Thanks so much. You're great. Thank you for your help. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. The British Horse Society have put together the Coronavirus Appeal. So please, if you can, donate £5. It's really simple. You've just got to text HORSE, H-O-R-S-E, to 70507. So to donate £5 to the Coronavirus Appeal, please text HORSE to 70507. Every bit of money will go back into the horse industry and that is what's so important. Uh, they've been working really hard at keeping riding schools together. With uh, They've put this fund together to help riding schools and there's advice and just they're offering so much support. So just that extra £5 will make such a difference. So thank you for that. If you need somebody to talk to, then you can message us anytime at Horse Hour. Just head to the Facebook page, drop us a message and we are monitoring that all the time. So please don't feel alone because you're not we're in this together and the one thing that i love about the horse industry is that when times are hard we really do support each other so uh, if you see anybody having a tough time don't forget to drop them a message or whatsapp or a text or even pick up the phone and say hey do you know do you need a bit of support through that Uh, so thank you so much for listening Uh, i'm going back to bringing out as many episodes as we can so i've got heaps of interviews lined up for you to get you through this period of lockdown if there's anybody you want me to interview then drop me a message and i will get in contact with them i hope you stay safe and uh, and if you need anything give us a text speak to you soon this is acast recommends every week we pick one of our favorite shows and this is one we think you're going to love hi I'm Louis Theroux, documentary presenter, journalist, locked down human. And I want to tell you about my new podcast, Grounded with Louis Theroux, from BBC Radio 4. Like you, I'm in lockdown, and so are many of those I've always wanted to talk to. So I've tracked down some famous, mysterious and controversial guests. I want to dig deep and find out how they became who they are today. We might be far apart but maybe we're more connected than we think. Acast is home to the biggest podcasts from Ireland and around the world. Subscribe to this show and hundreds more now via Acast or wherever you get your podcasts.